we've been looking at Jesus' final week here um, before the crucifixion. And we started with Saturday night when he had the big meal and, and we learned um, a whole new level of worship for him between that meal and the next day in Jerusalem. Um, he was worshiped at a whole new level and we still, I think, fall short today of worshiping him that, that strongly. We also studied Monday when he cursed a fig tree <laughs> and, um, and how he kind of upset the goings on at the temple on Monday. <laughs> um, last week we talked about Tuesday and Wednesday and um, that it was filled with him teaching the disciples last minute um, lessons to, to life. Um, we also learned that he gives us the same power that he had when he was a human on earth. And we talked about how with faith we can move mountains. So tonight we're going to move to Thursday. We're, all, we're getting there, folks. <laughs> Just a couple more weeks. And um, we're going to not talk about the Last Supper. That's usually what we think about on Thursday. Uh, instead, we're going to jump ahead to Gethsemane. And so at this point, why don't we just turn to our Bibles and read the, the passage. Um, we're going to look on page 977. I want to read Luke's account tonight, Luke 22. And we're going to read verses 39 through 46. So, starting with Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he, <clears throat> when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. I want to tear apart this passage, and I'm going to make reference to the other two Gospels. Um, as Josh mentioned earlier, um, Luke was a physician, and so his perspective was different. He also did not write his Gospel for the Jews, and so um, he phrases things a little differently sometimes. And we'll, we'll tear into some of that. This is after the meal. And when we focus on Gethsemane, we tend to kind of sum it up this way. Jesus prayed the disciples slept, the soldiers came. That's pretty much how we think about that night. But there's so much more involved in this passage. And so that's what we're gonna, gonna really dig into. First thing from this passage is that we find out that Jesus had a prayer routine. It says that as was his custom. Now we don't know if the time of day was his custom. We don't know if the place was his custom. Uh, what we do know is that what he was doing was not out of the ordinary because the disciples weren't throwing a hundred questions at him like they tended to do when there was something new. And they just followed him. And, um, and so my question as I read through this was, what's my prayer routine? And I would ask you to think about what your prayer routine is. Is it something that is so solid that nobody around you questions it? Now, the next thing is according to the other Gospels. We know that Jesus brought his three closest disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And he gives them instructions. And, um, but I, I envision a, um, 
I envision this group of guys, and it's kind of like us after we've had a ginormous Thanksgiving dinner, and all we want to do is nap. <laughs> you know, it's late, it's probably dark, and they're just sitting there, and I think that their flesh was just a little weaker um, than their spirit, and so they didn't. Um, sit there and, and pray as Christ had instructed them to. But I wonder how Jesus felt when he's all done with his prayer and he goes back and he finds the disciples sound asleep. And uh, I, I imagine that there might have been some hurt. Uh, when people disappoint us, we feel hurt. He might have just felt disappointed he might have felt lonely. He knew what was ahead, and he specifically brought these three disciples deeper into the garden with him and left them close enough. And, um, and so, you know, he may have, have had just, just felt plain lonely. We don't know his emotions, but what we do know is he didn't lose his patience. And... Um, he went and repeated his prayer. He went through this three times with these friends. And the other Gospels tell us that it was three times, even though Luke doesn't mention that. What I hope you're seeing is that when the Bible tells us that Jesus experienced everything that we experience, he was able to resist the temptation to sin. Now, he could have scolded them. I mean, he had every right to. For crying out loud, he asked one favor of them. He just washed his feet, their feet for crying out loud. He could have just been disgusted and stormed off, but he didn't. He asked him again and again. And as I applied this to myself, I thought, how often could I show a little more grace when I'm disappointed in family and friends and their behavior. The next thing is that, and I find this interesting, God sent an angel to minister to Jesus. Well, if we go back to the start of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 4, when the Holy Spirit led him off into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days, and then the old devil comes in and throws temptations at him, I want to read verse 11 from Matthew 4. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus began his ministry with angels ministering to him. And he ends his ministry with angels being sent to minister to him. Why do we think we have to do it alone? You know, what an example Christ is, that it's okay to lean on others and to allow God to help us through things. Another interesting thing in this scripture is that Jesus is praying in a garden. Um, the history of humankind, if you remember, started in a garden. And uh, sin came about in a garden. And the whole need for and promise of a savior <coughs> happened in that garden. We just finished a series about how important um, it is for us to return to the Garden of Eden and those things that God gave us when, when all was perfect and holy in, in the world. Jesus is going <coughs> to meet with his father before he's facing the worst kind of death he can face. And it's in a garden. Now, those of you that are naturalists get it. We just connect at a different level with God. We connect with the creator best in the middle of his creation. And, and I think that that is just so, um, so telling in, in Jesus' choice of a location to pray. Now, Luke calls this the Mount of Olives. The other 
um, writers call it Gethsemane. But again, because Luke wrote to non-Jewish people, um, he called it by a name that others would recognize more. And it's assumed that Gethsemane was an olive grove. Um, that's what tradition has told us. That's the place that they claim today is where Gethsemane was. But I don't know that we understand how strong the symbolism is in olives. And so the fact that Jesus was in the middle of this olive grove, I think, has some lessons to teach us. So olives first appear in the scriptures way back in Genesis after the flood. Noah has sent out birds, and he sends out a dove, and the dove comes back with an olive branch. And that could be the reason, I don't know, but olive branches symbolize peace. And the earth was certainly at peace after a pretty tumultuous flood. <laughs> and, um, and to this day, doves and, and olives symbolize peace. Now the oil from the olives um, fed people. I mean, they consumed the oil, they used it in their cooking and things. And um, they also used the oil to anoint priests and kings. And it was actually used for the sanctification ceremonies of the temple and the priests and that. I mean, it was, it was used in, um, in those processes. It was also the oil that was used in the, to light the lamps in the temple and the tabernacle. And then it also had medicinal qualities. So it was a pretty valuable um, item for them. They were so vital to the Jewish people that in Deuteronomy, God imposed a special tithe on, on the olive. So the fa I don't think it's an accident that he's in the middle of this olive grove with this prayer. I think about that little fruit, and I think of what it represented to the children of Israel. And I see Jesus. You know, Jesus is the light. He claims, you know, to be bread, that's food. He brought peace. Everybody didn't understand his kind of peace. It wasn't worldly peace, but a heavenly peace that he brought. And just like the oil from the olive, sanctified the priests. Jesus is our high priest, and we are sanctified through him to our heavenly Father. Now, I do want to talk about the prayer for, for a little bit. Jesus knew his time of fulfillment was near, and he had been in human form for over 30 years. He'd experienced you know, physical pain. He knew what hunger was. He knew what emotional pain was. Remember, he wept at Lazarus' tomb. So he understood all of that. And so here he is praying to God, knowing what's ahead. And what does he do? He asks God, I know you can do this. Let's, let's move to plan B. He didn't want to face that. He told God he knew that he could come up with another way. He's God after all. But here's the key. Ultimately, Jesus was willing to do whatever God the Father had, had asked. Now, I have friends that argue that Christians shouldn't pray um, for God um, to change his mind. Well, here's Jesus praying for God to change the plan. And granted, God didn't, did not change it, but Hezekiah prayed and asked God to change his mind, and God added 18 years onto his life. I don't think God minds us coming to him and asking for things as long as we're willing to accept his answer. Now, I also know people who think that you only ask God for something one time. He's God, 
He knows, he remembers. There's no reason to, to talk to him more than once about something. But Jesus prayed three times for the same thing in one night. And when I think about their logic, I automatically jump to the parable of the woman who went before the judge and drove him crazy with her constant pleas until he finally just gave her what she wanted, and I think it was just to get rid of her. Don't ever think God gets tired of our prayers. And when you're praying for somebody, especially when you're praying for somebody to do the right thing and to maybe come to know the Lord or, or to, to change their life and, and get rid of a sin in their life, don't ever think once is enough. There are so many testimonies out there of people who prayed and prayed and prayed for years. God does not get tired of our prayers. Now, we always think of Jesus praying in the garden by a stone. You know, he's kneeling by the stone and his face is heavenward and there's this holy light coming through in the darkness on his face. You know, we all picture that, that Renaissance era um, painting. But what would you say if I told you that the Greek in the Gospels says that Jesus was prostrate for that prayer? That means he was on his face flat on the ground. Our culture has, um, it's not trained us to pray that way. And, and so we just don't feel comfortable, especially in our country. And so we think that a posture of prayer is hands folded, heads bowed, eyes closed, you know the whole routine. But Jesus was flat on the ground on his face. Over 250 times in our Bibles, there is a reference to prostrate posture. And um, it was a sign of respect. Um, it was a sign of reverence. Um, they would do this before kings. Does God deserve less? He deserves more. He deserves more, exactly. Daniel prayed this way. Jesus prayed this way. Maybe we should give it a try. Um, you know, we may not be comfortable. We can do it alone. Nobody needs to be around. A couple of weeks ago, I played the song, I Can Only Imagine. And it was familiar to, to most of you. And the song talks about several ways that we might respond when we see Jesus when he comes back. I wonder, I just wonder, if it won't be prostrate, when we see him in his full magnificence. I don't think practicing now would hurt. Lastly, Jesus sweat blood. This is a medical condition that can happen to people, so it makes sense that Luke would write about it. He was a physician. And what brings it on is extreme stress. And, and I know everybody here well enough to be able to say, we all know what stress is. We've all experienced it. Can you imagine the level of stress Jesus went through to be sweating blood? Last week, we talked about how God prepares us, you know, ahead of time often for things that are trials and and um, disasters in our lives. Jesus knew what was ahead. That's what was prompting this, this prayer time. And it stressed him out. So when people tell you that if you're stressed, that something must be wrong with you, remind them that Jesus was pretty stressed. And like Jesus turned it over to, to the Father, we need to do the same thing. Gethsemane wasn't pleasant for Jesus. It was his final attempt um, to plead with God to change his mind. Um, there had to be another way that wasn't going to be as gruesome as what was ahead for him. But in the end, he was alone because his friends had fallen asleep. 
stressed to the point of sweating blood. He was so exhausted that God had to send angels to take care of him and help him. Yet he was willing to do what God asked him to do. The first time God sent the angels, he had fasted for 40 days. He was just weak. I mean, we know what it feels like to miss a meal or a day of food. Jesus had gone 40 days, and so his body was very weak. I imagine that it was equally weak at this point because of the emotions that he was going through and feeling. This is only the beginning of the night for him. Next week, we're going to look at what had to seem like the longest 24 hours um, for Jesus and for his family and for his 